Good morning. My name is Keith Meyer, and I'm the executive director of the Madison Square Park Conservancy. And it is my great pleasure to welcome you all here today for a conversation with Rachel Feinstein, Rafael Lozano Hammer, Hammer excuse me, and Allison Saar. Um, today's conversation will be moderated by Jacoba Urist, and um, and welcome. Um, as we all know, we're about to enter the beginning of the second year of this crazy pandemic. And one of the things that has remained constant is all the parks around New York City have stayed open. Um, we're incredibly um, proud to be a part of that park system and it's become increasingly clear that parks aren't just an amenity, but a central and key important part of our infrastructure um, to keep people, to give people uh, safety, respite and uh, relief. So we're very proud of that. Um, just a minor housekeeping thing. If you have a question, please type it into the chat function and our moderator will check in on um, questions during the question and answer period. And now it's my great pleasure to introduce our deputy director and chief Cur Martin Friedman chief curator, Brooke Kamen Rappaport. Uh, good morning. Thank you, Keats. And uh, thank you to our colleagues, Dana Klein, Hannah Stairs, and Truth Mary Cole uh, for their wonderful efforts on these programs and hello everyone out in the Zoom sphere. Um, we are so pleased that you're here today to welcome three distinguished Madison Square Park alumni artists and to witness their far reaching minds uh, discuss the challenges and turmoil of this last long year and also the potential for stunning creativity. Um, we have been hosting these monthly public conversations on Zoom with artists and journalists, uh, collectors, neighbors, art dealers, cultural leaders. Um, we've been hosting them since last June to consider issues in public art, contemporary art, and the civic, uh, civic space. The isolation we are experiencing now is an ongoing condition for some artists who work in the studio. And a number of artists have explained that they welcome the solitude and the boundless expanse of time. Um, while we're still living in and breathing in this period, now is a profound time to reflect with a raw understanding on the last 12 months, um, a long year of the pandemic, protests, and a tumultuous, brutal politics. It's my pleasure to introduce our speakers, Rachel Feinstein, who is in New York, Raphael Lozano Hemmer in Montreal, um, and Allison Saar from Los Angeles, and our moderator, art journalist and New Yorker, uh, Jacoba Urist. I urge you to read about and see the work of each artist because a short bio doesn't come close to demonstrating their significance. Um, I'd like to acknowledge Debbie Landau, former president of Madison Square Park Conservancy for her devotion to so many artists. And I'd like to remember the great Martin Friedman, distinguished museum director and a guiding leader um, on the Conservancy's art program. Martin worked closely with Raphael and Allison um, on their projects and we cite him with reverence. And now to our speakers. Uh, Rachel Feinstein was born in Fort Defiance, Arizona and raised in Miami. She received a BA from Columbia University and attended Skowhegan School. Her work was featured in the first iteration of MoMA PS1's Greater New York in 2000. Uh, solo exhibitions include Tropical Rodeo in Dijon, France, The Snow Queen at Lever House in New York, and Folly, installed in Madison Square Park in 2014. In 2018, Gagosian Beverly Hills presented Secrets, an exhibition of large-scale sculptures inspired by the Victoria's Secret Angels and Majolica uh, pedestals modeled, modeled after Rococo Commedia dell'arte figurines. The full set of Majolica sculptures was featured uh, at Freeze Sculpture 2018 in London. Rachel was selected for the Artist in Residence project, a collaboration between Gucci and Chatsworth House, um, realizing work for the Derbyshire, England historic site that will be on view until June 2024. And in November 2019, uh, the Jewish Museum in New York opened Maiden Mother Crone, her uh, major first retrospective exhibition. Uh, Rachel's represented by Gagosian Gallery. 
Rafael Lozano Hammer was born in Mexico City. He received a Bachelor of Science in Physical Chemistry from Concordia University in Montreal. He is a media artist working at the intersection of architecture and performance and creates platforms for public participation using robotic lights, digital fountains, computerized surveillance, media walls, and telematic networks. He was the first artist to represent Mexico in 2007 at the Venice Biennale. Uh, Rafael's public art has been commissioned for the Millennium Celebrations in Mexico City, the expansion of the European Union in Dublin, Pulse Park and Madison Square Park in 2008, the Vancouver Olympics, Guggenheim Abu Dhabi, and the uh, activation of the Rorica Roman Theater in Basel. And his work is in major international collections. He has received many distinguished awards and has been the subject of recent solo exhibitions, including the Hirshhorn Museum, Amore Pacific in Seoul, and a mid-career retrospective co-produced by uh, the Musée d'Art Contemporain de Montreal and SF MoMA. His recent installation, Border Tuner, connected people across the US-Mexico border using bridges of light controlled by the voices of participants. Uh, Raphael's represented by Pace Gallery. Alison Saar was born in Los Angeles and continues to live and work in Los Angeles. Through her sculpture, prints, and paintings, she addresses issues of race, gender, and spirit. She studied art and art history at Scripps College and received an MFA from the Otis Art Institute. Her awards include a John Simon Guggenheim Memorial Foundation Fellowship, National Endowment for the Arts Fellowship, United States Artists Fellowship, and a Joan Mitchell Foundation Award. Um, she has exhibited at major museums, including the Hirshhorn and the Whitney, and her project, Falvin and Fallow, was commissioned by Madison Square Park Conservancy in 2011. She was included in the 1993 Whitney Biennial, and her work is in major collections, including the Brooklyn Museum, Hirshhorn, MFA Houston, Indianapolis Museum, the Met, and the Whitney. Uh, she is represented by L.A. Louvre Gallery. Jacoba Urist is an art journalist living in New York. She has recently written about art and architecture for publications including The Atlantic, New York Magazine, The New York Times, Smithsonian, and Gagosian Quarterly, as well as covered the art market and art news for the art newspaper. Jack is also a contributing editor for Cultured Magazine, where she profiles contemporary artists. I'm so thrilled to be here for your dialogue today. Um, Thank you everyone for participating. And now on to our moderator. Hi, good morning. Thank you everybody for watching and most of all to our artists for participating in this conversation. I thought to sort of dive right in, I might ask you each to reflect a little bit on those first few days in March, uh, mid-March, uh, when so many of us felt you know, time just suddenly stopped or the world stopped and we were thrown off our usual professional and personal hamster wheels as it were. And tell us a little bit about those early days and weeks, what life was like for you. Did you have access to your studio, where were you? Um, and, and just what that experience um, was for you personally. Anyone wanna jump right in? I'll, I'll go, I guess. Um, I, we were um, in New York City and I was about to have um, a big panel discussion um, for the closing of my show with a bunch of people that had flown in um, from all over and we were basically going to do it that very night and they decided the whole thing was gonna shut down. I think it was March 12th. And um, so it was a big, a big, you know, scramble for everybody to get planes out to make sure they can get back to their countries or where they came from. Um, and then the next day we went to the North Fork um, thinking that it was gonna be this quarantine for two weeks and we were just gonna hold up out there. Um, I have two children with autoimmune diseases. So we were very worried and we wanted to keep them very safe. And um, I don't have a studio out there. So we were out there from March 13th till um, basically the end of June. And I had no access to making any work. And it was 
it was very difficult. It was very, very hard to not have any ability to have also just space. Um, and I was feeding and cleaning and taking care of five people and um, worrying about food. And it was, it was definitely um, a realization of how an artist, especially a woman artist with children needs a lot of support to be an artist. And, um, and I really um, have a deep appreciation for, for my babysitters and my housekeeper and people who let it be so that I could be the artist that I am. And, and it was a big, a big, huge eye-opening experience that way, yeah. That's amazing also to sort of think about you being without your studio and without any kind of capabilities to create during that time. When you came back in June, did you find sort of what was that experience like then to come back and have access to your studio? And your I actually couldn't do anything. I think I was, I, I got into such a survival mode that I became almost like hysterical about food. It was, it was very bizarre. I, I would get up in the middle of the night and try to, you know, make reservations for like any kind of delivery service or cause I was so afraid of buying food at a store and that whole thing. And, um, and so I was just obsessed with everything. I was obsessed with like buying flour, like things that I've never thought about. And it became primeval. It really did. And it became about, um, you know, being the mama bear and, and making sure that my children just were safe and protected. And so I couldn't turn that off. And I wasn't able to make art until September. It really mm -hmm. took me that long. I, 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 I mean, my husband was wonderful and he cleared out a, a room for me so that I could try to make drawings and I just couldn't. I, I, I was unable to have the absolute panic and dread. And, 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 and I think that um, it was again, the realization that I think for so many people in history who have been artists have been able, it's a, such a gift, you know, to not have to worry about survival. And I think that it just, you know, it made me realize why so many women artists in history haven't had children and haven't or have come from wealthy families because it's such a gift to not have to worry about just the most basic like fear of 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 hunger and of death and of all these kind of major things. So, um, so I had to kind of have my kids settled and um, and safe, and then I was able to to do work in, in September, basically, yeah. What about for either of you? Can you share a little bit about your experiences? I think you were in Montreal, right? And Allison, you were in Los Angeles during the early days. Right, um, for myself, um, I had just actually came off of a really busy, crazy year. And I think Freeze LA, I had a show um, and so, it was maybe like two weeks after Freeze LA that things started to shut down here. And I was really honestly ready to step back a little bit. So I maybe approached it, came into the pandemic from another headspace. Um, I was working at home. Um, uh, you can see my, I'm, I have a print studio at home. So I did small prints. I you know, took up whittling and made very tiny, tiny sculptures and um, I don't know, it kind of took me back to, um, you know, growing up with my mother in her studio and which was the kitchen basically, and just, you know, trying to make do with what we could in our small private personal spaces. And so for me, I think it was, um, it was a good time to really kind of step back and really think about things and have, you know, a little bit of time to um, be alone, so. It was maybe a different for me. That wore off quickly, but <laughs> initially it was really, sure. I was grateful for it. Not grateful for it. That That's really totally, that sounds callous and whatnot. But um, for me, it felt like a time that um, it allowed me to do things that I wouldn't do normally. I would always be hustling and bustling. I think I was supposed to fly to Chicago, you know, that week and everything got canceled. And so um, usually, you know, my schedule is flying and speaking and going all over the place and um, just staying at home has really taught me a lot about uh, being grateful to have this space and um, enjoying it, so. 
And what about you, Raphael? What was it like for you at the beginning? Well, for me, I was actually in New York, March 3rd, uh, having Korean uh, dinner with 12 people and five of us got infected. So oh, I, no. I got infected with COVID in early March, brought it to Canada. I think I'm the vector that actually, con you know, brought the infection to this country, sadly. Um, I have a precondition of asthma, so it got pretty hairy for about two weeks there. I had to just medicate and, and, and just monitor myself. Fortunately, I didn't have to go to hospital, but it was, it was quite humbling. And it was just this fragility of somebody like myself who's a megalomaniac and I just always running around and stressed and so on. It just forced me to clamp down and uh, yeah, and lower expectations. And that's really, really tough. Um, I became one of those for a while, no longer, but for a while I became one of those insufferable people who says, well, I'm learning from COVID, you know, I'm, I'm become, you know, so I started doing it all. I did meditation, I did yoga, I dropped caffeine, I took anti-anxiety drugs, I got divorced. I mean, all of it. I did, I did all the different things that one could do. And, um, and the truth is that my, my problem as an artist is that I'm, I'm different in the sense that I, I'm not really someone who's talented with his hands. I don't have like a special a specialty that I can go to in solitude. I work in a team, right? So in my studio, I work with specialists. There are 15 people in the studio and the studio had to shut down March 11th or something like that. So it was a very different situation for me where I kind of lost all of my bearings, all of my team. And then it all just became a concern over how can I support the platform when we can't create, you know, physical, you know, projects. Uh, so many uh, exhibitions got canceled and postponed. So, so it was tough. And, and I think that I, I got really quite stressed, especially about just, you know, how do you support operations over time? Um, now I'm back on caffeine and uh, I'm, uh, I'm starting to ramp up. Uh, I think I'm going to come back, but not at 100%. I, I hope to come back at 80%, you know, something that, that uh, is a little bit more respectful of a new normal, you know. So I did learn something from COVID. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to shift gears a little bit, actually, and um, think a little bit with you about the three of you um, about public art. And one of the things I've um, really noticed um, in New York, and I was quarantining in Connecticut at the beginning of March and April, which is the role, um, as Brooke mentioned earlier, um, about parks and about public art in particular and public sculpture. And I'm wondering your thoughts on that in terms of accessibility and being outdoors and this enormous role that I think public art has played for a lot of us during this 10 month, 11 month um, experience. Um, and if there's any public art that you, you know, sort of convened with or, um, you know, kept going back to or, or experience that you might be able to share with us. I mean, I, there's the calder that's in, um, in Gramercy Park that I walk around um, to walk my dog and, um, and it, and it just, I, you know, I just see it through the gates and it's just been, it's been wonderful just to have the, the bit of color and just the whole experience that there's something there. And, um, and also I know from friends who have told me that Chatsworth has been open, the gardens in, in England, and that um, that's been a really special, they have an incredible garden there and it's enormous. So people can really socially distance and that people have found a lot of solace from just going there, you know, and getting, getting outside. And I think that um, that's the thing with New York City is that we don't get to have long walks through a giant park unless you go to Central Park, but you know, to have Madison Square Park just so close and just be able to walk through when you're feeling very isolated and very, you know, closed in in your existence, in your place in New York City, it's, it's very important, definitely. Allison, any thoughts about Los Angeles and, and the public art there? No, unfortunately, we don't have a lot of public art sculpture gardens out here. Um, and the ones, well, hmm. 
you know, I think, you know, the Huntington actually has um, part of Made in LA, but I think those galleries are closed. So it hasn't been quite as accessible here in Los Angeles. And, um, you know, our museums have not opened at all during the entirety. So a few galleries. So we, we did make it to some galleries, but I can't recall actually going out to see any public art, but we have been to plenty of parks. So if we did have parks with public art, it would have been great. Yeah. <laughs> and what about in Montreal? Um, actually, uh, Caldera also. We have a beautiful Caldera from Expo 67 that is just gargantuan. It's lovely, but it's very far away. It's in, um, you know, in basically the old Expo grounds. And uh, I got opportunities to bike there and be around it. It's, uh, it's a really wonderful um, place. I did manage to, with the studio, to create a, a public art piece during the pandemic, uh, which is a sculpture that is now at the Museum of Language. And it's, in fact, a tree. It's a biomimetic piece that um, is basically this tree where vine and ivy grows. And then as you walk underneath it, the flowers are actually loudspeakers. And mm -hmm. as you walk underneath, it triggers um, 400 different languages um, from the world because it's for the Museum of Language, Planet Word. Um, so it was nice to actually work outdoors throughout this period. It was nice to deliver a project that people could approach um, and come together. I've always thought of public art as a, as a place of assembly, um, of course, reflection, but also assembly people coming together. And that's the only place that you could do it throughout the pandemic. So, so it was, we were lucky to have one project that could bring people and experience something together. Shifting time a little bit now forward to May, June, July, obviously the country experienced an incredible um, groundbreaking moment of, of reckoning um, and protest. And I'd love to, to shift to that, that period of this year. And, and maybe start with Allison, um, because of your practice, the depth of your practice over the years, of course, Maybe you could tell us a little bit about the print lives that you created for Black Lives Matter and a little bit about your impression during that time and your experience um, of, this, of this seismic moment. Right, yeah. You know, I think in some ways I was really frustrated because um, with all the um, um, demonstrations and marches for Black Lives Matter, I didn't feel like I could participate. Um, because um, I was also caring for um, my mother, who's 94, and we wanted to make sure that she was safe. And so I couldn't really physically get out there and, and kind of be with all with everyone. So um, instead, I decided to create a piece. I created a, pink, a print called Rise, which um, um, uh, I was fortunate enough to collaborate with Leslie Ross Robertson, who um, additioned the, um, the, the print on her letterpress. And we were able to kind of put the work out there. And with the help of my gallery, LA Louver, who facilitated selling them and everything, we were able to raise funds for three organizations here in Los Angeles, uh, Dignity, Dignity Now, um, the Crenshaw Dairy Mart, and uh, some everything. So, um, so it was kind of a way to somehow uh, give back and, and be out there in, in some form. And I think, you know, um, that helped sort of alleviate some of the, the anxiety and frustration for not actually being able to be out there physically. But um, yeah, so, you know, we kind of try to find ways to do things that we can in our own small, uh, small way, but uh, that's what that was all about, yeah. Can you tell us a little bit about the print imagery, how you selected it and a little bit about about the print particularly? Yeah, well, you know, as a child living in Los Angeles during the, the Watts resurrections uh, or insurrection, um, you know, that has always really left a deep impression with me. And then also, you know, growing up with my mother whose work was very political then and kind of Los Angeles in the Bay Area, sort of uh, Black Panthers sort of imagery, um, looking at um, the prints and the photos coming from there. And so I think I was really inspired for this piece by um, the women of the Black Panther Party. And, you know, I think the media has given so much attention to uh, the, the posing males with their guns and whatnot. And really it kind of over, it obscured and eclipsed the really powerful, meaningful work that these um, women were doing in terms of, and men too, in terms of making breakfast and 
helping the elderly and helping people vote. And um, it was just such a, a really powerful organization for that community. And I think um, I really wanted to especially pay tribute to the women who I think maybe got a, a little, you know, got a little bit of a short shrift in, in the whole thing, so. Speeding through time a, a little just with you, um, what are some of your thoughts? Um, I think we all obviously witnessed um, last month uh, the Capitol um, riots and takeover, um, you know, just, and it was baffling imagery to try to process. And I'm wondering, kind of given your practice and an insight, you know, what, what that was like kind of looking at that imagery and, and some of your thoughts. It was, Sorry, was first, go ahead. <laughs> yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah. For anybody, absolutely, Any, anybody. I mean, I, the whole thing just couldn't, it didn't seem real. It just was, it was so shocking that I just, I'm still trying to even just, it's, it just seems like it's a movie. <laughs> it's so shocking that I still can't get my mind around it, to tell you the truth. I don't even know how to process it. I just keep, I think it's like all of us, we just, we just are so grateful that, that, um, that there's a positive change and that we have um, something that's, that's, making it feel like we all are more united. That's, I, I, I just don't even, I don't even know how that happened. And I'm still just imagining that, um, I think a lot of people are still deeply in shock about that, that day. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's just, it's still, it's still, I mean, I, I think a lot of times you, as an artist, you don't know what, I mean, so a lot of major things that happen in the world, it just takes a long time to process it through your own body. And then it comes out somewhere else later on because of it. It's just, it was so unexpected. I, I yeah. I think sort of moving also to sort of another kind of staggering, um, a staggering kind of unfathomable thing for most of us to put our head around is, is this, um, this number of people who have, who have died across the world in our countries, um, depending on where we are, but also just worldwide. And so I wanted to shift for a minute to Raphael's COVID, I think of it as a COVID memorial project. And if you could talk a little bit about that and you know how you're sort of trying to process that too, the staggering number of people who have been lost this year. For sure. Um, so uh, curator Guadalupe Medina at Mac Museum in Mexico and I uh, were thinking about how to um, show the scale of, of the problem. Uh, in Mexico, we were uh, way over 100,000 dead, which is the absolutely worst outcome that all predictions had all over the world. As we know, all of those predictions are being blasted. And yet those numbers are quite um, they're, they're material, they're abstract, they, they don't, they're not personalized. So we wanted to create an artwork that would allow us to sort of scale the problem. But also another thing that we wanted is um, to have some kind of ritual to allow people to mourn. Um, there's a lot of stories of people whose dad starts coughing three weeks later, you know, he goes into a hospital three weeks later, he's dead. Nobody could accompany him in his journey. Um, funerals, wakes, uh, speeches, all of these things are very important to, you know, have closure and to, and to observe and, and remember uh, a life. And so how could we create an artwork that would allow people to congregate, even if it was online, to see it? So if you want, I can show you, uh, I can share my screen to show you what the project is real quick. So if you go to um, a crack in the hourglass.net, a crack in the hourglass.net is basically a site where you can send an, an image of your loved one. Um, it's received uh, here in my studio. And then we have a system of um, basically an hourglass that drops a little bit of hourglass sand to draw the likeness of the person. So if you go into the website, you'll see hundreds of people who have sent their loved ones. And one of the things that we want to do with this piece is to have the experience be live. So as you're live, you can see it be drawn. It takes about 20 minutes to draw the portrait so that people could assemble and think about the person. 
But mm, equally importantly is that for each one of the of the of the participants, we make um, basically a memorial page with an obituary or dedication um, with a real image and also with the video of how their person, their, their drawing um, was made. Crucially, as this piece is drawing with the sand, um, it's doing so in a platform which is robotic. And after a drawing has been made, automatically the system um, will, um, will erase the image and recover all of the sand to be reused for the next portrait. So all the hundreds of portraits made so far are made with exactly the same sand. And this is the moment that, um, that the platform, the robotic flat platform tilts, and then all the sand gets uh, pulled by gravity. And it's uh, just like a harrowing moment of this return to this container, and then it gets reused for the next person. So this project um, is live, it's a crack in the hourglass. And uh, so far, most of the people who have sent their images are in Mexico because that's where the project started. But it's really nice to start seeing, uh, you know, people from all over the world start to use it. Um, and that's it. It's just, we think of it as a, as a contribution, you know, uh, the, the Aquila member says that, you know, humanity begins and ends with the observation of this passage and it's inhuman not to be able to have a robust ritual of, of passing. And so I know this does not replace uh, what we can't have now, which is this, you know, funerals, wakes and so on, but at least it's something that contributes to that sense of memory and personalization. It's, there's faces behind these terrible statistics. Mm -hmm. Quite beautiful. I was thinking maybe we could talk a little bit about some of the exhibitions that you had. Rachel, maybe we could start with you in terms of your exhibition obviously closing and sort of being isolated. It existed, but nobody could obviously see it for months and months. And then of course, for both Alice and Raphael, you've also had um, exhibitions delayed or canceled. Um, and so I was hoping we could just talk for a few minutes about what that experience has been like as an artist preparing for these monumental um, shows and then kind of having them locked away. We can start with Rachel, I think. I feel so lucky that, um, that I was able to have basically the, the run of my show. I, 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 the show opened on November 1st and then it was going to close on March 22nd. So when it shut down on March 12th, I was one of the very lucky people that ended up um, not having to lose very much. And I feel very sad for people that had been working on shows for many, many years and the, it has, still hasn't happened. Um, and I think that um, basically what ended up, um, thank you, <laughs> I just got some coffee. <laughs> um, I think the thing that was very, um, was very strange was 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 this idea of closure and um, and wanting and getting so worked up about this whole show and knowing that it was going to happen and then it was going to close and then I was going to move on to the next thing and I think a lot of people are in this moment of just being stuck and not knowing what is happening and so I did this piece that was um, from 2001. This was part pictures of my show, but I think a very um, important thing that I realized was, was what stuck with me was this sculpture that was called Crucifixion that was the first figurative work I made. Um, and it, I made it after September 11th and it came out of the blue. It just, it just popped up in my psyche, which is why I was bringing up this idea of channeling stuff that's happening in the world and you, that are, that's, that's so, so major that you don't know how to, how to take it. And so I made this piece, it was from a Grunewald painting and I, I didn't know why I made it. And, um, and a man named Stephen Vincent contacted me and wanted to interview me about why I made the work. And, I, and it was an odd interview because I, I couldn't explain myself and I was very, lost with my own words. And he, um, he had a feeling about September 11th being very important uh, enough that he moved to Basra to do work on um, writing about what he saw. Um, and he, he was murdered for um, 
discovering corruption in the police there. And that really stayed with me. And so this piece has really stayed with me in, in terms of what's happening to the world right now and the idea of symbols. So I've started Jung Jungian um, analysis right now with, um, with the therapist and I'm really interested in archetypes and symbols and why, why historically they've existed in every culture in the history of the world. And so this is kind of the, the starting point for what I'm working on right now, which I still don't know what it is, but I want to go very deep and I want to discover this, this, this river that runs through all of us, that has the same symbols and the same images in all different cultures and all different times in history. And what do they mean? And what do they say to us? And how do they get, and how artists have always tapped into this to try to get people through these times. So that's where I'm at right now. And the crazy thing is, is my show stayed open till January 17th. And so um, it was itself almost like, Sleeping Beauty under the glass coffin where it just remained there um, for a long time um, sealed. And then people started to come and see it in mid September, which is when I started making work again. So it was somehow, I guess the release that I was waiting for. It was one of the very last shows that I saw Rachel before everything completely shut down. I had gone back to see it a second time. So I was, um, and I was happy to see it reopen of course in the fall. Um, Allison, I know you have two shows, or it is one exhibition, but in, I, I believe across two venues that is a little bit on hold. So I wonder if you could talk about that experience as an artist right now in California. Yeah, so this is a show called Ether and Earth that was um, supposed to be the grand opening for the Benton Museum at Pomona College. And then also at Armory, which is in Pasadena. Um, these are both locations that I have sort of infinity to my, you know, I kind of grew up with my grandparents um, in part in Pasadena and, um, and then uh, Pomona College is part of the Claremont Colleges and I went to Scripps. So I was really excited about the show and I love having exhibitions on university campuses as well as the Armory is uh, also a teaching um, venue uh, that has art classes. So I was really excited and unfortunately um, nothing has been able to be opened. Um, the, this is, these are the installations at the Benton, which we went ahead in Pomona and installed. And I had actually also installed a public piece um, called Imbue, uh, which will be a permanent piece at the museum. So I think we installed that at the very beginning of the summer. Um, so that was the one public piece I was able to get finished um, in the midst of all this. But, um, but I think, you know, kind of the saving grace was that we had gotten some funding to do a catalog, really my first major catalog. So um, that was really exciting for me. So, you know, whether anyone will actually ever get to see either of the shows, um, we have a catalog that can kind of really talk about what was happening. And um, yeah, so it's, it's frustrating where the Armory I think is being uh, put on hold until they could possibly open. So we're, you know, we're, kind of making it up as we go along. <laughs> but, um, and I had, yeah, this other show I had, uh, a prince has been traveling and um, has been to three venues with no access. So mm. hopefully at some point um, we'll be able to open up that show to the public as well. It's been really um, interesting to me and not something I would have necessarily predicted how different cities are opening museums so differently and exhibition spaces. So in New York, of course, we've been lucky that we've been open while at reduced capacity, of course, but Los Angeles, unfortunately, in California, I understand we have these exhibitions that have been years in the making that are, as Rachel kind of pointed out, kind of just frozen, frozen in time, and so we're waiting for people. Um, Raphael, I was hoping maybe you could talk about SF MoMA, I think, if I'm correct, but also there's a particular piece I was interested in hearing about in terms of circular breathing. And I think that is a really interesting, um, very timely piece to talk about. Thank you. Yeah. So I had, I was supposed to uh, open my show at SF MoMA in May. And then of course that got canceled first and postponed later. So it will um, come on the show. It's called Unstable Presence. It'll happen starting in October of this year in a reduced uh, version. 
one of the pieces in this project is about the idea that the atmosphere is trying to kill us, right? COVID is just a symptom of globalization. It's that the, our, our, our crying speech today is, I can't breathe, right? The Eric Gardner, the Floyd, the sense of asphyxiation, the sense of our biosphere uh, deteriorating to the point where we're breathing 422 parts per million of carbon dioxide. No one has ever done that. Climate change is rampant. We are living in a max, mass extinction. So how can one take these very important environmental and social considerations in, and sort of imbue them into or make them tangible in a project? And so here's uh, the piece that was going to premiere uh, in the United States at SFMOMA. It's this work that I wanna show you. It's called Vicious Circular Breathing. And it's been shown in several countries before, but basically it's uh, a medically sealed uh, glass chamber that invites people to breathe the air that has been breathed by everybody before them. So you enter through a decompression chamber that gets clear of all the clean air that came in, and then you are invited to sit inside of this recycled toxic air. There's big warnings against contagion because there's no yeah. filter. There's a warning against panic because to get out, you need to go through the same uh, decompression chamber and the warning for asphyxiation because there's only 10 days of oxygen and we ask you to stay for only about 10 minutes max. So when you enter the cabin, your air, uh, together with everybody's breath from before, goes through this massive tubing. And then that tubing is taken to um, bellows that are inspired from um, 17th century organs in Europe. And then those bellows are moving um, these valves, controlling 61 brown paper bags, which inflate and deflate about 10,000 times a day, which is the normal respiratory frequency for an adult at rest. So these brown paper bags are kind of like a portrait, a communal portrait of everybody who is breathing this toxic air. And for me, this project is interesting. Of course, now, can you imagine during COVID times <laughs> showing this, this piece is impossible? But even at the beginning, I thought this is gross. I would never go into this cabin. It's more of a conceptual work. But in all the shows that we've had in the past in Mexico and Madrid and Istanbul, people line up to go into it. And I find it really fascinating. Uh, it's uh, it's kind of like a perversion of the concept of participation where we're always talking about participation as something positive. In this piece, if you participate too much, you die. Um, and also the idea that your participation is making the air more toxic for future participants is part of the, of the message, if you will, of this kind of piece. Um, I never went in except for the very beginning, um, but, um, but it's a project that I think, um, you know, eventually will bring it back. There is, there is as a funny story, uh, an organization called the Gray Area um, Art Center wants to show that piece that as a moment doesn't want to show. They, they insist uh. that this is the right time to show it. So maybe we will pull out that asphyxiation chamber. I'd be very curious to see after this if you would get people in there or get a line. I'd just be curious emotionally what our space is going to be like afterwards, of course. For I sure. think before we turn to questions, I'd love to just ask you each, um, you know, it, it's a big question, I guess, but the takeaway, right? Um, here we are, we're at the year mark almost, and it's been a year of just, you know, complete upheaval in every way possible and so much darkness. And I just wonder if there's a positivity or maybe I'm really looking for positivity, but if there's a takeaway um, and maybe there isn't a positive um, takeaway um, in every case, but what's changed for you that you might take into the future of your art practice or your professional or personal life? something maybe that changed for the better um, or, or at least had you thinking in a different, in a different way. Um, and of course, it doesn't have to be positive. You can say, you know, no, actually there's, there's nothing um, that this moment I think has you know, given me to take into the, the future of my practice. But I'm just curious about the takeaways for all of you as artists. Uh, I think for my... I think for myself is that, you know, having really forced to spend a lot of time with myself, it has really kind of taught me that I'm really, um, 
it's renewed my interest in sort of this intimacy in the studio and um, really taking the time to really uh, think things through in a way that I think sometimes was getting lost with all the hustle and bustle. It has also kind of really opened my eyes in terms of all the amazing things that are happening locally and the importance of supporting local organizations and just really being appreciative of your corner neighbor, your corner um, like neighborhood market and all of these small things that, you know, were put at such great risk during this time. And so I think that's really caused me to start, you know, stepping back from all of this sort of major, you know, online and flying and all of this stuff um, to kind of just really think about the here and now and, um, and also just really kind of, it's been really great and being able to really spend a lot of quality time with one's family, which is often getting lost as well, so. Rachel, do you have any thoughts? It's a fellow New Yorker too, I'm, I'm wondering sort of. I mean, I think the whole thing um, has been really, um, yeah, it's you, you stop in your tracks and you all of a sudden realize, well, do I really need to do this now? Do I really, it changes your outlook on a lot of things. It changes your outlook on, on how you had you thought that you had to show up at this place or you had to get your kid into this college or you had it kind of doesn't matter it seems it seems that there are things that we personally or society has placed upon us that possibly can be done in a completely different way that um that you can make happen it's just a restructuring that I find really fascinating, and um, and I hope it continues because I believe it is a gift that 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 it, everyone has paused in that way, um, just in the sense of having a br a, br a breath, and that you wonder, um, can we at least try to learn from this? And of course. Um, it's been devastating for the world. And I hope that this never had happened, but how do you try to learn from it is, is what I'm trying to do. And that's why I'm taking that moment to do this deep, you know, Jungian analysis, which I never had time for. And I never thought, I, I always said, I wanna do it, but now it's this way of, I hope the whole world is, um, is able to come closer together by understanding the reasons why we do things, which I don't think we had time to think about before. We were just trying to just get them done and check off those boxes. And, um, and that's, that's where I'm, I'm hoping to see the, the light at the end of the tunnel for all of us to just locally and personally within your own family. And then, and then as, as Allison said, the, the, sh the store that you never really kind of thought about and now you realize it's it's your lifeline and all this kind of thing going outward from that and, and in terms of the whole world. And if we all can make that connection, I think it will make us just, a, I mean, a much better world overall, you know? Rafael, do you have any, any thoughts about kind of coming into the second year in the future? Yeah, awesome. I mean, I, I echo what my colleague said, it's um, personally, there's, uh, there, there's definitely uh, some very important questioning going on. I'm also thinking about the bigger um, sort of political issues, you know, like I'm just don't take democracy for granted, for example. This is one thing that has come out of this very loudly, right? I have so many friends that have always thought, oh, it's all the same shit. It's like, no, it's not all the same shit. Yeah. What we need to do is we need to be diligent with protecting the institutions that are being, you know, attacked constantly that keep the, the checks and balances against a clearly racist adversarial um, group of people who, you know, are our peers and with, you know, we, and I'm not talking just the United States, I mean, uh, you name it, it, nationalism is running rampant. And to advocate for a society that is based on facts, you know, it's that science is, is actually listened to, that, um, you know, for example, I'm very optimistic about this word, uh, this term, flattening the curve, because I think everybody now understands flattening the curve is what we need to do to gain control or, or a reasonable uh, control of COVID. Well, that's exactly what we're going to have to do with climate crisis. We're going to have to flatten the curve. And I think that that's a useful 
piece of, of now common knowledge that this is how we need to address it, except that this is not over months, it's over decades that we're going to have to work on. So I'm optimistic about that. I also have a 16-year-old climate change uh, activist at home, and I just look at her and I just, I'm so excited about how, how she thinks about the world. And, uh, and she says, well, why are you excited about me? You're also living in this planet. You got to do something yourself. You know, don't, don't, don't just hope on me, you know, like you gotta, you gotta act. And so I, I just love the, 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 the synergy of, of this young um, sort of approach to planetary problems, which need planetary solutions. And I don't think we're equipped to have to, to, to address them yet. I'm going to switch to the chat now. And if you just bear with me, I've never actually done it as the moderator. So I'm just trying to scroll, um, which did work. Work. Um, and we've got a lot of great questions here. Um, let's start actually, um, one of the questions is, um, if you all have been spending a lot of time on Zoom, and if you find that you're connecting with other artists, curators differently, perhaps. So I know we talked about this a little bit offline, but how much you all have been spending on Zoom in terms of uh, you know, discussions, talks, other artists? Ben, I'll go first. I feel like I keep going first. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I would say that I actually don't spend very much time on Zoom in the sense of, um, I have, I have a solitary practice, so I don't really have to meet with a lot of people in, in, in terms of, uh, I know friends of mine who have to do Zoom from the morning till the night for their jobs. And I, 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 I think it must be very hard. Um, I do do Zoom every day with yoga, which I really, really like. And I found that in the beginning, I thought I would hate it. I find it really strange and extremely amazing that my Sometimes my video goes off and I swear there's a telepathic thing happening sometimes that you can mm -hmm. understand exactly what she wants you to do and she can see what you're doing even though she really can't. I, I, I've been finding that there are, that are again, positive things. If you, can, if you can kind of almost take out the visuals and just hear the voice um, you, it's very transference. And again, going back to that thing that I'm trying to get into that deep river, it, it's, it, it's really been interesting and fascinating to just do it as an auditory experience versus a visual one for me. So. I think what I like about the Zoom is uh, looking at all the chats and seeing that all of your friends are out there yeah. <laughs> waving and saying hello. And it's so in a weird sort of a way, it is a sort of, a kind of casual sort of social scene. And I guess what I need to do is kind of set up things where we just all get together and chat. But yeah, I guess, um, you know, we had to cancel many um, live lectures and talks, but I think the Zooms maybe have come back a little bit more. And I think it's, um, and I, I'm, I'm curious to see how this will carry on because um, I know everyone saves a lot of money with traveling and all of that. So um, we'll see if that kind of carries on. I'm interested to see that too. We had talked about I've been doing studio visits on Zoom, you know, from Los Angeles artists in particular instead of traveling there. So I'm curious how we broach that on the other side. Rafael, what are your thoughts on Zoom? About Zoom? Oh, I mean, I, I'm spending too much time on it. I do work with my team, not through Zoom, but through other. Um, you know, sort of video conferencing platforms. And uh, I, you know, I, 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 it's unsatisfactory. It's, it's awful. I, I wish that after a talk like this, we could go for a drink, which is where mm -hmm. ideas actually brew. And um, lately I've been um, trying to DJ some parties through Zoom. And actually there's ways to actually channel my decks into it with reasonable quality. And so at least the dancing part is is beginning to happen, and that's that's optimistic. But um, but yeah, I I, I I think there's something about it that uh, like everybody else, I'm just exhausted exhausted of of not being able to be in the press, you know, surrounded by by people and meeting new people. Uh, it's it's uh, but it's also wonderful. Can you imagine if we didn't have it? Um, how we could keep ideas <laughs> floating and and you know this kind of of meeting. So, yeah. 
I too cannot wait for those artist dinners and post panel drinks. And there is there's nothing like it. As wonderful as Zoom has been to fill in, I I hope it doesn't take over. We've got a lot of really good questions. So I'm gonna start, um, we have a few more minutes. What advice would you give to artists forming their practice during this time? That's a great question, I think, for artists out there in the audience. Any advice during this particular time that you might give artists listening? I think just keep looking at things like using this time to really, I'm super into watching Maya Darren again and just kind of going back into looking at things that I looked at when I was in college or, or I never knew about. I'm, I'm very interested in hearing from all my friends, like what they're watching and what they're looking at. And I bought tons of new books, like, you know, just crazy amounts of books and just, doing that whole introspective thing to figure out yourself and what you want to see and who you are um, because there's so much outside chatter that we usually are dealing with that using this time to not let anyone influence you, influence yourself. Just just use the wonderful opportunity to, um, to just do deep dive research and go into that and figure out who you are and what you want to see. And also hone in your practice. Like, you know, if it's about drawing, just draw more every day. Uh, I, you know, I'm making a big drawing every day, which I haven't done again for years. Just all these kind of things just have been wonderful in that way of just um, the endless amounts of time <laughs> just to use it as if you, if you can, yeah. I think it's also an opportunity to really be innovative in terms of um, experimenting with materials. If you can't have, if you don't have access to buying certain materials or, I mean, myself, I do a lot of, I get a lot of my materials from flea markets and things like that, which aren't happening anymore. And so you just kind of like got to step back and really think, well, what can I use? Or, you know, well, in New York, it's great. You just walk down the street and there's so much stuff on the street that you can just drag home. And, you know, I think that's the way I started my career and why I started using found materials was because I didn't have the funds at that time to access and buy all of these things. And so I, you know, what could I use instead of, you know, certain kind of paints or certain foundations for putting things on or, you know, didn't have the funds to do things in a foundry. And so I think it's a chance to really kind of think about um, just to invent you know, in, in this, in, in, you know, you make maybe things smaller if you're in a smaller space and, you know, maybe things not quite as ambitious if you don't have people to help you. Um, but uh, I think this really amazing things can come out of sort of the limitations that we're facing as well. What about you, Raphael, to end any advice for the artists? Um, Apart from what Allison and, 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 and Rachel shared, I think that um, the only thing would be just to say, be gentle. This is an unprecedented pandemic. You know, you can't be very productive. This is not the wheeling and dealing moment. This is not when you're going to find your big chance. You know, take it easy. Forgive yourself. Don't take it all upon you to save the world. Just, uh, just know that this is going to end and that... Right now, you need to take a deep breath and 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 just survive. That's that's it. Because there, there's so much, so much ambition. You know, a lot of people say, oh, "I'm going to learn French." You know, it's like, no, you're not going to learn French. It's like, just don't learn French. It's like, just don't. Just take a breather. You know, it's 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 also important to observe that yeah. uh, mental health is it's real. It's a real issue. You know, you need to take care of yourself and take it easy. I had to get off Instagram because I just would look at people doing things and I just said, <laughs> I, I'm doing nothing. And so I just I deleted Instagram. I couldn't do it anymore. It just was making me just feel so awful and I already felt awful. So yeah, <laughs> yeah. Find out what you need to do is true. I think that's a very good point, Raphael. Yeah. Well, thank you all. Um, this has been really wonderful to get to chat with you um, both on, on the panel and off the panel a little this week. And I think, we're gonna um, hand it over back to Brooke. Um, Rachel and Raphael and Allison and Jacoba, this has been such an amazing 
conversation this morning and you've all been so deeply thoughtful and also um, incredibly open about your family space and your workspace um, and your home space. And we're all so grateful. Um, I sense that everyone is still reckoning with and wrestling with um, this period still, and we can only anticipate um, how this will come out in your work and look forward to, to seeing that um, and, and thinking about the future um, in your ongoing participation. So um, thank you for joining Madison Square Park Conservancy this morning. It's been such an honor um, to have all of you here. Um, you're visionary artists and we had a wonderful moderator. Um, so thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Alice Green. <laughs> Phew. Great. Oh. <laughs>